The Ford Mustang GT3 is an ACC for several weeks now. I've been driving it for two and a bit weeks straight. And today I'm going to share with you what I found, how you can tweak the setups to your liking. And by the end of the video, you will know which setting has an impact on which driving situation and how you drive the car. So uh, stay tuned. Together with Mark Toll, I have created a setup and data bundle. If you buy that, you will get access to setups for the Mustang for all the tracks in ACC. The accompanying data allows you to easily compare and understand the differences from your driving to a professional sim racer's driving. And the combination of data and setups will pretty much instantly make you faster. So if you want to skip the learning part and just want to get to the driving, head over to popometer.io, get the data bundle and call it quits. All right, let's go through the basics of the car. Part of it all is, and I'm not telling you any secrets here, is of course the massive V8 engine in the front of the car. It produces a ton of torque in basically every driving situation, in every RPM. And of course, it sounds fantastic when you rev through the gears, when you listen to the pops during the upshift. However, having such a big engine also comes with problems. The engine is heavy and it's mounted in the front of the car and in comparison to other cars in the game, it's mounted further to the front. Even when they put the gearbox in the back, they still only managed a weight ratio of almost or near 50-50, as they put it, which indicates it's probably biased towards the front a little more, which is probably in ACC terms more similar to the Lexus. And you do feel that while driving. The car is very stable. And in fact, it's almost too stable. And in a lot of situations, it will tend to understeer. The other problem is that with how the engine is placed and how much torque it instantly delivers, the massive power you have always kind of struggles to find grip out of especially first and second gear corners where it's all down to your right foot to help the car find the traction. For comparison, the also front engine BMW M4, which we mainly drive on this channel, has a weight ratio of 48 to the front and 52% to the rear, meaning it has the center of weight a little further to the back. And that helps the car be a little more agile and be more willing to rotate around the center of the car and just be nicer into the corners with the rear actually helping you to get around there. Why mention the BMW in particular? Well, from an aerodynamic perspective, the Ford responds pretty much exactly the same as the BMW does. And that means it behaves the same when the car pitches forward, when the car squats down on the rear, when you lower or raise the front or rear right height, or when you change the rear wing angle. Sharing the same or similar aero map to the BMW with a different weight distribution means that aerodynamically speaking, the Ford responds and behaves the same way as the BMW in a lot of situations where aerodynamics are the most impactful factor, and that is mostly the fast corners. This means that the car will under and oversteer from an aerodynamic perspective the same way the BMW does. The problem is that this aero map paired with a more understeer inducing weight distribution by design gives the car kind of an inherent stable or even understeering nature that is hard to overcome with setup or, or driving. And the aero balance can't really offset that, so to say. You basically can't set it aggressive enough to counter the weight distribution. And while this car, or while this fact makes the car great for beginners for that reason, the car would essentially need a more aggressive aero map towards the front in a way to become more agile. Now, you can do adjustments here with the setup by reducing the rear wing, for example, but this also means giving away total downforce, which usually we don't want to have. So we have to get the car rotating differently. And this basically, this is basically what the entire car setup is going to be about. And we'll talk about this in the video. 
to make a decision which setup setting we are even going to touch, we first have to make a little separation between all the possible driving situations the car can be in. To break it down, there are slow and high speed corners, or from another perspective, there are corners where aerodynamic aerodynamics take little to no effect, and there are corners where aerodynamics are going to be the dominant factor in the corners. So for changes to slow speed corners and slow speed behavior, we look at mechanical aspects of the setup. And for changes to behavior in fast corners, we look at it mainly from an aerodynamic perspective and try to choose settings that affect that in the first place. Then there are essentially three corner phases, breaking and into the corner, through or middle of the corner, exit or well, out of the corner. We can always be more detailed here, but just kind of for the purpose of this video, we'll try to keep it short. Combining these things, so corner faces and fast and slow corners, you'll get somewhat of a matrix with high and low speed corners on one axis and the different driving phases of a corner on the other axis. And that allows us to break down all the driving situations the car can possibly be in around the track. And for each of these, we now have different setup options that we'll quickly go through one by one for the Mustang in particular. Now, there's a bit of a problem. Basically, all the available settings that we have have an impact on all of the possible driving situations. So it is a bit overwhelming and difficult at the beginning to choose the correct setting for any given situation you're trying to address. As a start, you can watch another video I made where I solely break down all the available settings in a setup in terms of if they cause over or understeer. So as a start, make sure to check it out. For this particular video though, we want to focus on the main problems of the Mustang. A lack of traction in slow speed exits in particular versus kind of the lack of rotation, especially in fast corners. And solutions for these problems tend to directly work against one another or contradict one another. So this car setup, as always, is going to be about a compromise depending on the specific track profile we're facing when we drive around the track. How you can understand the track profile is roughly by kind of matching the amount of straights or the amount of fast corners versus the amount of slow corners. And not really so much by the actual amount of corners, but the amount of time you're going to spend on specific parts of the track. Say, if you spend half the time of a lap on a straight, it probably might make sense to focus your setup on straight line speed. If you spend half the time of a track in high speed corners, however, you maybe want to focus on high speed corners for your setup and have good performance there. But if you spend, I'm just bringing up the number again, half your time around the track in slow speed corners, then perhaps it makes sense to focus a setup around issues particular for slow speed corners. The key starting point to the setup is understanding the aero map of the car you have available. Generally speaking, the closer the front end of a car is to the ground, the more downforce it is going to produce. However, there is also a too low where in fact the car starts producing less downforce again, but we usually cannot set up the cars in ACC low enough to go towards this threshold. Old generation cars also need the rear to be as close to the ground as possible to generate the most downforce. Uh, one example would be the BMW M6 that you basically couldn't drive with any rake for that reason. But modern cars all produce more downforce on the rear end, the higher the rear actually is. Same here for, as for the front, just the other way around is there is a limit to that as well. So. The higher you go, you'll first get more downforce, get, go even higher. At some point, the car is going to lose downforce again. And this varies drastically per car. You'll see cars like the Mustang, the BMW, or the Aston or Mercedes that can basically drive maximum brake and keep producing more downforce, while other cars 
perhaps the mid-engine ones or the Porsche. At some points, when you go too high on the rear, they will start losing downforce again. Another factor very crucial to understanding the error map then is the rake, which is the difference of front right height to rear right height. So if this is the front and rear, this is zero rake. If uh, that is the front, that is the rear now, then we have rake being the difference from front to rear right height. So if your front is set to 50, your rear set to 80, we're talking of 30 millimeters of rake. What rake does is it often increases the downforce on both ends of the car. So by adding rake, you'll add downforce to the front and you'll add downforce to the rear as well. The problem is this doesn't often happen exactly equally. There are some cars that will add similar amounts of downforce if you add rake to both front and rear axes. And there are cars that will add varying amounts of downforce to the front and rear axis and thus also change the aerodynamic balance of the car quite drastically. And then there are cars which have different ranges where they first elevate the level of downforce equally on both ends of the car and then you add more rake and the downforce balance kind of grows apart. This is all possible in ACC. Now for the Mustang, you will see clicking through the aero map that there is indeed a range where the, the aero variation doesn't change too much. And even if you add more rake, it moves only a tiny bit to the front. So the car is very insensitive, so to say, to, to rake. But there is a, a range that is even more stable and there's a range that is a little more sensitive. So when you're clicking through the right heights of the Mustang, you will see that the error percentage behaves in pretty much exactly like that of the BMW. Without any rake, the car will have somewhat of a 2% balance value. And just be assured that balance value does not carry over to other cars, right? So a 2% value on one car doesn't mean a similar balance on another car with a 2% number. It solely only just works for one car. Increasing the rear ride height, you will see that the aero balance only changes very little compared to other cars. Clicking even further, you will see that there is a range where the aero balance doesn't shift at all. And then that kind of means that the car would behave the same somewhat in fast corners with either value in this range. Just that the total downforce with less rake is going to be slightly less, but also means less drag. That gives us kind of some wiggle room here because we can get the same aerodynamic balance, but with different mechanical outcome because if the rear is higher we have a more sensitive rear in slow situations if the rear is lower we have a more stable car in slow situations but as you can see we would have roughly the same car in high downforce situations however you will always have to keep in mind that the car while driving the ride heights are never really constant they always change and the stiffness of the springs or the range you allow the bump stops to, well, until the car hits the bomb stops will have a huge impact on the actual ride heights while you're kind of driving and in every different driving situations. So you can control a lot how the ride heights change throughout a lap. And with the bump stops in particular, you can control how much the car dives under braking and how much the rear squats under acceleration. Think of it as kind of forcing the car into a certain rake and kind of limiting the amount it, it moves around the middle axis. And unfortunately, a bit in ACC does not provide right height readings in, in Motec or also on Popometa. We can't read that data from the shared memory, it just doesn't exist, which always leaves us a little in the dark as to where the right height actually sits. And we will have to make assumptions and a lot of testing to find out how the car responds to yeah, kind of adjusting or limiting the error range we want the car to be in throughout the lap. As I said in the beginning, the car is often very understeery in fast corners, and that will likely lead us to running a lot of rake just where the error map starts shifting forward again a tiny bit. That sadly will cost fraction out of the slow corners as now the rear sits so high and doesn't really press nicely onto the rear wheels when we're accelerating out of the slow corners. 
but usually more downfalls will outweigh any other issues in terms of lap time. So we will just accept low traction out of the slow corners, but gain the time back in the fast corners with a better aerodynamic balance. But again, it also depends on the track profile. And it can be beneficial to do it that way for pro drivers, but especially for non-pro drivers, which 99% of people are in sim racing, for those, it can be beneficial to make use of this insensitive aero map and kind of just running less rake without losing too much downforce, without having the aero balance too far back. And sometimes you can just make an adjustment to the wing a little to bring the aero balance forward a bit again, but have the benefit of a bit better traction with the rear end sitting a tiny bit lower in the setup. For example, on Paul Ricard, this works pretty well. And if you buy the bundle, you will see how we solve the car there. We can, of course, further fine tune this. The aero map and the right heights always play kind of the, the most important role for the car setup. They set the base to how everything is going to behave. And now we're starting to go into already smaller steps with the springs and roll bars, for example. Of course, we can use any other setting, but I would go into this direction first. If, say, we want to have better traction, what we can do is always keeping the front spring or or and and <laughs> the front roll bar is always a step higher than the rear one. And not just by the by the value, for example, the spring, the minimum spring value on the front is always a bit higher already than the rear, but actually just add another click and also make sure that the front roll bar always shows a higher value then the rear there, the gap can be even larger, two, three, maybe even four clicks to give the car more tracks and make it more stable and understeery. However, if you want the car to be more aggressive, a little more rotating, you can just kind of do the opposite, bring them closer together, bring the front roll bar down, bring the rear roll bar up and do the same with the spring, bring the front spring down and the rear spring up. And automatically you will have a car that is more willing to rotate at again, a tiny bit of cost in terms of traction. It really depends on the car you are on and also your driving abilities, what you're able to handle, especially because the car is so traction limited and so sensitive on the throttle that I guess for most of you, traction should be the focus, but doesn't mean that you can learn to play with the throttle and then you can start setting up the car ever more towards a more aggressive style response and make the car rotate through the car nicer and then start dealing with around the traction with your right foot instead of the setups so the better your right foot the better you'll be off in the mustang that already kind of throws us right into how the car should be driven first is since the car is not very responsive very heavy very long the weight balance is further to the front it tends to understeer we can work with a rather low steer ratio to make the car a little more responsive. That just means that when we do a tiny movement on the wheel in front of us, we'll get a bit of much more movement on the front tires already. Then with a high steer ratio, we can do huge movements on the steering wheel and we'll get just a tiny movement on the front tires. So making your steering faster and more sensitive with a low steer ratio can help with the thought kind of upset the car almost on purpose into fast corners to make it a bit more willing to rotate. The other thing with the car is to work around this understeery tendency is in the end, of course, the trail braking. And as soon as you start coasting the car, it will understeer. So we are going to see or what you need to do is trail very deep into the corners, very cleanly into the corners, keep the brake on for a very long time on a very low level. And then once you're done with that, you need to be back on the throttle right away with the right aggression, with the right amount to keep the rotation of the car alive and then manage along the torque of the engine and increase the power to the maximum output as you exit the corner. This becomes a bit of a problem the slower the corner is, because the slower we go, the more downforce we lose, the more tricky the car gets on throttle out of the turns. So you need to be ever more careful. The slower the corner is, the trail braking stays the same. You still need to be precise there. You still need to be deep into the corner on the trail braking. You need to go very deep and sh uh, with a tiny bit of input, 
uh, very far into the turn and then pick up the throttle right away just even more careful now than uh, in corner exits of fast corners the good message for everyone though is that the traction control on the mustang is working really well i don't know if kunos has reworked it or if it just turns out to be really nice on the mustang for whatever reason it's the sim is a complex system in the end with so many factors coming into play that perhaps even if they use the same tc of another car it would just turn out to be nice on the mustang whereas it isn't on on the other car we also have two different traction control settings on the mustang and it really gives you a lot of uh, options here with the car you can run tc1 on well much higher levels than on other cars like on tc1 it will just slide as if tc was still off on tc2 you will get engagement when you're really sideways tc3 still lets it go quite a bit tc4 is where it really starts engaging but you can fine tune this even more with the tc2 setting and you can also go really high there you almost don't feel any impact on one to four or five even and you will start feeling the impact of the tc2 setting from say six to eight or so i probably wouldn't want to go 10 or 11 it just gets a bit much there but having something like TC1 on 3 and TC2 between 6 or 8 or something should probably give most people quite a good feeling. For the slower guys struggling a bit more, TC4 for uh, setting 4 for TC1 and maybe 8 or 9 for TC2 should probably not solve your traction issues, but solve your sliding out of traction limited corners. Now people are surely asking, why didn't you mention dampers? The thing is, dampers have the least impact on your setup, but you can spend the most time of it on them. So if, if you're done with everything else, okay, just go with the dampers, literally go to min or max them all and really try to see a major difference to your driving and your lap time. What I want you to see there is that even if you go to extremes, the behavioral change in the car is not going to be as much as, as some people think there is in the dampers. The only thing that really works on the Mustang is the rear rebound setting. And the lower you set it, the more likely the car is to rotate into the fast turns. And that is kind of a, well, not so much of a secret, but a very effective thing where you might not expect it. But other than that, I. I'm just going to tell you, don't worry about the dampers too much unless you have too much time on your hands. All right, guys, I hope I was able to get the idea of this car across and you have at least a rough theory in your mind how to set it up or a direction you want to explore or something like that. And if you want to shortcut all that, you just head over to popometer.io get the data bundle I did together with Mark Toll. We have all 25 tracks covered for the Mustang, a qualifying, a race setup, sometimes even several setups when we weren't quite sure. There's a lot of detail in the description what you can still do with the setup to adjust it to your liking or particular issues you have. And then once you use these setups, you can solely focus on your driving and also compare, of course, to our labs, how we drive the car, and improve your lap times this way without having to worry about the setup whatsoever. So thanks guys for watching. Leave a like, subscribe. As we do, we thank the partners that are making this all possible. We thank the team that is still having me on board for the upcoming SRO series. And kunos for the game. So we'll see you in the next one. Goodbye.